Hello! In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. Suppose A and B are sets. If there exists an injective function from A to B, and there exists an injective function from B to A, then there exists a bijective function from A to B. Okay, now to start out the proof, well, we're trying to prove if this is true, then this is true. So let's suppose that this is true. Well then, there is some injective function from A to B, we'll call it F, and there is some injective function from B to A, I'll call it G. Now, every function is surjective to its range. So G is surjective to its range. And I'll call the range of G R. So why are we saying this? Well, if we think of G as a function from B to R, then G is a bijection from B to R. The reason why is because, well, we know that G is injective, and we know that G is surjective to R. So yeah, G is a bijection from B to R. And because G is a bijection from B to R, this tells us that the inverse of G is a bijection from R to B. Okay, so now we're going to define a recursive sequence of sets. And all of these sets are going to be subsets of A. In other words, they're all going to be elements of the power set of A. So the first set in our sequence will be A1, and it's going to be an element of the power set of A. Now, to obtain all the other sets in our sequence, we are going to consider a function that goes from the power set of A to the power set of A. As you can imagine, we can take A1 and send it into the function g, and we will get an output value. We'll call that output value a2. Well, since a2 is an element of the power set of a, we can send a2 into the function g, get an output value. I'll call that a3. We can send a3 into the function g, we get an output value of a4, send that into the function g, get an output value of a5, and so on and so forth. So, in general, we're going to have that a n plus 1 equals g of a n. Right, so this is the general structure of our recursive sequence. But specifically, we're going to take a1 to be a set minus r. And our function g is going to be defined as follows. We're going to take each subset of a and assign it to this set. It turns out this set is also a subset of A. So using this function, we have that a n plus 1 will be equal to g of a n. So taking a prime, substituting it for a n, we have that g of a n is precisely this, where we replace a prime with a n. So really all we've done here is we replaced a prime with a n. Well, we know that a n plus 1 is going to be equal to g of a n, so let's just replace g of a n with a n plus 1. So this is how our recursive sequence is going to be defined. Okay, and now we are going to define the following sets x and y. We're going to define x to be the union of all sets in our sequence. And we'll define y to be a set minus x. Now notice, every element of a belongs to either x or y, but not both. The reason why is because if we give ourselves an arbitrary element in A, well, if we're in X, then we're in X or Y as required. But if we're not in X, then we're in A, but we're not in X, therefore we're in Y. 
So we're at x or y. So yeah, we can all agree that every element of a belongs to x or y. How do we know we don't belong to both x and y? Well, if we do belong to both x and y, well, we belong to x, and since we belong to y, we don't belong to x, so that's a contradiction. So yeah, we don't belong to both x and y. So we can agree that this is true. Another thing that's true is that every element of y belongs to r. The reason why is because if we give ourselves an arbitrary element of y, then we belong to a, but we don't belong to x. Well, since we don't belong to x, this means we do not belong to the union of all sets in our sequence, which means we don't belong to any set in our sequence. So in particular, we don't belong to a1. So we don't belong to a sub minus r, which means either we don't belong to a or we belong to r. Well, we know we belong to a, therefore we must belong to r. So yeah, every element of y belongs to r. So, because these two facts are true, we're allowed to define the following function. Right, and let's make sure that this definition makes sense. If we give ourselves an arbitrary element in A, call it A, well then, exactly one of these options is true. Well, if A belongs to X, then we'll just assign H of A to be F of A. On the other hand, if A belongs to Y, can we assign H of A to be G inverse of A? Right. G inverse of A only makes sense if A belongs to R. Well, since a belongs to y, and every element of y belongs to r, a must belong to r. Therefore, g inverse of a makes sense. So what this tells us is that every element of a can be assigned to a unique h of a. So yeah, h is definitely a function with domain a. The reason why we know h is a function from a to b is because no matter which output we get, well, f of a is an element of b, and g inverse of a is an element of b. So yes, h is a function from a to b. And our claim is that h is a bijection from a to b. If we can show that h is a bijection from a to b, we will have shown that there exists a bijection from a to b, and the proof will be complete. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to have to move back into the top, so let me just write down some important things up here. Now, we're going to show that h is a bijection from a to b. But before we do that, there's another thing I would like to write up here. Notice, g is a function from b to r, and g inverse is a function from r to b. From here, we know that g inverse compose g is a function from b to b. And in fact, g inverse compose g is equal to the identity function on b. Also, g compose g inverse is a function from r to r. In fact, g compose g inverse is equal to the identity function on r. So since g inverse compose g is equal to the identity function on b, this means for all x in b, g inverse compose g evaluated to x is equal to the identity function on b evaluated to x. In other words, g inverse of g of x is equal to x. Similarly, since these two functions are equal, we have for all x in R, g of g inverse of x is equal to x. So I'm going to write these two facts up here, but I'm going to write them in blue just so it isn't too confusing. <laughs> 
So now let's show that H is a bijection from A to B. And to show this, we're going to show that H is injective, and then we're going to show that H is surjected to B. Let's start by showing that H is injective. To show that H is injective, let's give ourselves two elements, P1 and P2 in A. And suppose H of P1 is equal to H of P2. From here, all we want to do is show that P1 is equal to P2. If we can show that, then that will show that H is injective. Now first, we're going to eliminate the possibility that P1 is an element of X and P2 is an element of Y. So assume for a contradiction, P1 is an element of X and P2 is an element of Y. Well then, when we send P1 into the function H, we get that H of P1 is equal to F of P1. And we know that h of p1 is equal to h of p2. And when we send p2 into the function h, well, since p2 is an element of y, we get that h of p2 is equal to g inverse of p2. So f of p1 is equal to g inverse of p2. And we know that f of p1 and g inverse of p2 are both elements of b. And g is a function with domain b. So we can send these two guys into the function g, and they have the same outward values. So really, g of f of p1 is equal to g of g inverse of p2. And since p2 is an element of y, and every element of y belongs to r, we know that p2 belongs to r. And we know that this statement works for all elements of r, so it must work for p2. Therefore, g of g inverse of p2 is equal to p2. So, g of f of p1 is equal to p2. Now, since p1 is an element of x, this means that p1 is an element of the union of all sets in our sequence. So, p1 must be an element of some set in our sequence. Well, since n is a positive integer, if we take n to be the n we have here, well then, a n plus 1 is precisely this set. And we have that g of f of p1 must be an element of this set, because g of f of p1 fits this form. And p1 is an element of a n, because that's what we have right here. So yeah, g of f of p1 is definitely an element of a n plus 1. And g of f of p1 is equal to p2, so p2 is an element of a n plus 1. And since p2 is an element of a n plus 1, this means that p2 must be an element of the union of all sets in our sequence. So p2 is an element of x. But since p2 is an element of y, this means that p2 is an element of a set minus x. And therefore, p2 is not an element of x. So p2 is an element of x, and p2 is not an element of x, so we reached a contradiction. Our assumption that p1 is an element of x and p2 is an element of y led us to a contradiction. So we have eliminated this possibility. A similar argument also eliminates the possibility that p1 is an element of y and p2 is an element of x. I'm not going to write out what the argument is because it turns out the argument is precisely the same as we did right here. The only difference is everywhere you see P1, you'll write P2. Everywhere you see a P2, you'll write P1. And so we've eliminated this possibility, and we've eliminated this possibility. This leaves us with two possibilities. Either P1 and P2 are both elements of X, or P1 and P2 are both elements of Y. And in either case, we're going to show that P1 is equal to P2. Let's start with case 1, where P1 and P2 are both elements of x. Well, in this case, if we send P1 into the function h, we get that h of P1 is equal to f of P1. 
And we know that h of p1 is equal to h of p2. And when we take p2 and send it into the function h, we get that h of p2 is equal to f of p2. So we have that f of p1 is equal to f of p2. Well, since f is injective, it follows that p1 is equal to p2. So this completes case one. Now let's move on to case two, where we have that p1 and p2 are both elements of y. Well, in this case, when we send p1 into the function h, we get that h of p1 is equal to g inverse of p1. h of p1 is equal to h of p2. And when we take p2 and send it into the function h, we get that h of p2 is equal to g inverse of p2. So we have that g inverse of p1 is equal to g inverse of p2. And since g inverse is injective, it follows that p1 is equal to p2. So in either case, we have shown that p1 is equal to p2. And putting this together now, we see that given any two elements, p1 and p2 and a, where a to p1 is equal to a to p2, it follows that p1 is equal to p2. So this shows that h is injective. So all that's left to show is that h is surjective to b. To show that h is surjective to b, let's give ourselves an arbitrary element q in b. The whole goal from here is to find some element in a such that if we were to send it into the function h, we would get an output value of q. In other words, we want to find some element p in a such that h of p is equal to q. So, since q is an element of b and g is a function from b to a, we have that g of q is an element of a. And since every element of a belongs to x or y, it follows that g of q is an element of x or y. And from here, we're going to show, in either case, there exists an element p in a, such that h of p is equal to q. Let's start with case one, where g of q is an element of x. Well, since g of q is an element of x, this means that g of q is an element of the union of all sets in our sequence. So, g of q must be an element of at least one set in our sequence. Now, it cannot be the case that n is equal to 1. Because if n was equal to 1, then g of q would be an element of a1. So g of q would be an element of a set minus r, which means g of q is not an element of r. But g of q is an element of the range of g, so g of q is an element of r. So yeah, we'd reach a contradiction, and that's the reason why we can't have that n is equal to 1. And because n is not equal to 1, this tells us that n minus 1 is a positive integer. And because n minus 1 is a positive integer, if we take the n here and replace it with n minus 1, this tells us that a n is equal to the set of g of f of a's, where a is an element of a n minus 1. So since g of q is an element of a n, this tells us that g of q is an element of this set. So g of q is equal to g of f of a for some element a in a n minus 1. Now, since g is injective, this tells us that q is equal to f of a. But then, since a is an element of a set in our sequence, this tells us that a is an element of the union of all sets in our sequence. So, a is an element of x. And since a is an element of x, if we take a and send it into the function h, we get that h of a is equal to f of a and f of a is equal to q. And so this completes case one, because we have found an element in a such that if we were to take that element and send it into the function h, we get an output value of q. Now let's move on to case two, where g of q is an element of y.
Well, we know that g of q is an element of a, so if we take g of q and send it into the function h, well, since g of q is an element of y, we have that h of g of q is equal to g inverse of g of q. But since q is an element of b, we know that this is true for all elements in b, so it must work for q. So taking x to be q, we have that g inverse of g of q is equal to q. So this completes case two, because we have found an element in A, such that if we were to take that element and send it into the function h, we get an output value of q. Namely, g of q is the element of A we would send into the function h to get an output value of q. So, we have shown in either case that there exists an element p in A such that h of p is equal to q. So putting this all together now, we see that given any element q in b, there exists an element p in a such that h of p is equal to q. And this tells us that h is surjective to b. And so we've shown that h is injective and we've shown that h is surjective to b. This tells us that h is a bijection from a to b. And so there exists a bijection from A to B. So this completes the proof. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.